Good evening. Welcome to another session of the precepts from the Proverbs. Tonight, we would like to express our appreciation, thanking each of every one of our viewers for tuning in despite being a Monday, which is actually a very busy day. For our viewers who are in the ministry, it's understandable that Mondays are rest days or for some even chore days. But tonight, we thank you that you can spend a little while, pause, and listen to the Word of God. Now, busyness is indeed a part of the modern life. However, it is also good to take time to pause and to consider things in life. Now, wisdom actually helps us to pause and consider some things. Now, our passage tonight would be the causes or the considerations that wisdom would cause a person to have. So let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18, and tonight we'll be looking at verses 1 up to verse 24 of this proverb. Now let's start our study reading verse number 1. That says, Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Now desire is destructive. Solomon says that. Because of desire, a man would separate himself. That is how the scripture puts when one is beside himself. And being beside oneself, one intermeddles with wisdom. And to intermeddle simply means to interpose or interfere improperly. When de desire is driving a person, it interposes on all wisdom inappropriately, and what happens is that it leads to folly. Now, we read more of that folly in verse number 2 that says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Now, truth is, when desire drives a person, when we are driven by our instincts, when we are desired uh, impulses, we become foolish and delighting in no understanding, we would not be able to discover ourselves. Desire, my friends, lead to folly. This folly prevents a man to consider his ways and discover himself having no delight in understanding. Now, Solomon actually calls this wickedness. You can see that in verse number three, when Solomon says, when the wicked cometh, then comes then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy, reproach. Desire that leads to folly is actually wickedness, and its end is contempt, ignominy, or shame, and reproach. Now here's a point for consideration tonight. How are my desires? What are the things that drive me? Are they good that lead to good, or will they only end to my destruction? Do consider the warning of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, where he says, But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we consider our ways. We consider our desires. The desire to be rich is one of those driving desires that lead to a temptation and a snare and to many foolish and hurtful lusts. But that's not only the desire to be rich, but also if you would turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 to 24, we would see that there are times our desire to be more than what we are actually is detrimental to our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 17 to 24, the Apostle Paul gives this counsel, saying in verse number 17, But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? 
let him not be uncircumcised. Is any man is any called to be, to be uh, is any called in circum uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, that he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man were, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Now we would see there that we ought to consider our desires. And in our driving desires, let it not intermeddle with wisdom, which leads only to folly and destruction. Now let's go back to our passage and let's read, read verse number four. That says, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and, uh, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Words can be a wellspring of wisdom, but sadly, it can also be a source for something else. Now, we would read that something else in verse number 5, where Paul says, where Solomon says, It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Words, as much as it can be a source of wisdom, can also be a source of wickedness in, in overthrowing the just in judgment. There's more. Verse number 6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. Not only can the words of man be wisdom, it can also be wickedness, and it can also be folly that is contentious and strike-worthy. There's another one in verse number 8 that says, The words of a tale-bearer are as wounds, and they go down into the inner part, innermost parts of the belly. Now, the words can be of those like a tale-bearer that actually wound, defile, and it goes deeply in the innermost parts of the person. This helps us, therefore, to consider how are my words? Are my words the words of wisdom? Or are they the words of a wicked, overthrowing righteous judgment? Is it foolish being contentious and strike-worthy? Or is it the words of a tail-bearer that wound a person deeply? To consider, mark your words because you are marked by your words. It's no surprise, therefore, that the Apostle Paul adjures the believer, saying in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, verse number 9, we continue reading in our passage. He also that is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. Slothfulness is a great waste. For this reason, our Apostle Paul exhorted believers in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now do consider this. How is your work ethic? Are you slothful in business? Or are you fervent in service, knowing that you are serving the Lord and not man? Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 10 we read, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run, runneth into it and is safe. Now, on the one hand, we would see the security of a righteous man is the Lord. Now, here's another option. Verse number 11. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and as an high wall in his own conceit. If the security of the righteous is the Lord, the rich man's security is in his wealth. Now that would lead to conceit, which is simply pride. And there is verse number 12 that says, 
Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Security in one's wealth will end in destruction, but the righteous humbly trust the Lord, and that leads to honor. Now, here is a good consideration. What is my security? Is it my own or the Lord's? Now, the best place to actually question about a person's security is, it, is when it comes to his salvation in this dispensation of grace. So consider this. If I'm going to ask you today, how do you know that you are saved? How would you answer? Would you answer, you know you're saved because of something that you did? Maybe you said, I am baptized as a member of this church or that denomination or that group or that group. Or maybe you'll say, well, I have repented of all my sins. I have confessed with my mouth. I have done something. And that is my security. Now consider this. Did you know that in Romans chapter 11, verse number 6, the Apostle Paul says, And if by grace, then it is no, is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So consider this. If you are saved by something that you do and you base your security on that, then my friends, how can you say that you are saved by grace? But do know that grace with any addition of works frustrates that grace, nullifying it. So where is your security? My security is that I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that His finished work, that is, His death on the cross for my sins, His burial and resurrection, are sufficient to save eternally and justify absolutely. My friends, we are saved in this dispensation of grace by trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, don't take my word for it, but do take the word of God himself. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, the apostle Paul says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Did you see there? The moment a person trusts in Christ, he is sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, this is premised on hearing the gospel of our salvation, which begs the question, what is the gospel of our salvation? Now, we could read that clearly and plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4 that says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That, my friends, is the gospel message. We hear that, and we trust, saying, Oh, Christ's death is indeed for my sins. His burial and His resurrection indeed is for my justification. What Christ done is sufficient to justify from all things and to forgive all trespasses. I pray that when it comes to your salvation, your security is in the Lord and not in what you do. And if the Lord can secure you in your salvation, shouldn't He also be our security in all other things? Now let's go back to our passage in verse number 13. Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 13. Solomon says, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Now, my friends, consider this. It is foolish to be reactive in any matter. As a matter of fact, 
we ought to pause and consider a matter before we respond to it, especially when it comes to the truth of the gospel that I presented to you today. Now, maybe when you heard the word gospel, you would say, well, I already know that. I don't need to listen to the gospel message anymore. Or maybe it's this way. You heard the gospel of the death of Christ for our sins, burial and resurrection. And you would say, wait a minute, that is not the gospel that I received. Now, you may react and say, oh, this is a different gospel. Oh, this is not the gospel I believe. Or you say, oh, I already know this. I won't listen to it. Well, consider, my friends, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame to him. We pray that you would give consideration to these things and the Lord grant you understanding in all things. Now, verse number 14 of our passage in Proverbs chapter 18, Solomon says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but the wounded spirit, who can bear? Now consider this. He, what ails you? Is it the infirmity of the body? Because if it's only of the body, the spirit of a man can sustain it. But an even graver issue is the brokenness of spirit. Because remember, we live and move and have our being in God. But sin would have separated us from God. No wonder the world's a mess today, right? But do consider this. God grants reconciliation to a person, not by his works, not by his merit, but by the death of his son, and much more, we shall be saved by his life. Consider what ails you. Verse number 15, Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 15. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Consider this. What you seek for betrays what your heart is. So what are you seeking for? Are you seeking for knowledge? Are you inclining your ear to wisdom? Or is it nothing? The vain things of this world. What we seek determines what we have in our hearts. Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 16. A man's gift, make it room for him and bring it him before great men. Now do consider, am I making the, the most of the time in order to access an audience? Now we have to make most of every opportunity. We have to redeem the time and we have to make sure that we manage all the access that we can be granted with. Verse number 17. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Now, we see that he that is in first seems to be just. But when a neighbor searches him, it turns to be otherwise. Therefore, it would be prudent, it would be wise to consider both sides of a certain story or of a certain matter before we actually make a, just, a judgment. Consider this. Have I considered both sides of the story before passing judgment? Remember, we are told in scriptures to make just judgments. Verse number 18, we read, The lot causeth contentions. The lot, content uh, the lot causes contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. Now, know this. The lot, when it comes to Israel, is not simply about the luck of the draw. But the truth is, it is a way for their people to determine the will of God. As a matter of fact, in Joshua chapter 18, verse 4 to 6, we would see that the tribe's inheritance were determined by the casting of lots. Now, this is rooted in the understanding, as in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Now, consider this. Have I accepted the lot that has befallen me as of the Lord? Now, do remember that our Apostle Paul exhorted believers in this dispensation of grace, saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You can give thanks 
because it's not random. It is God's will. Verse number 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle, of a castle. Now Solomon says, an offended brother would be extremely difficult to win. Difficult, but not impossible. Consider then, how can I win back my offended brother? Verse number 20. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now we see, we see this, that words, that words, can be filling. Actually, we could read that in Proverbs chapter 20, uh, chapter 18, verse number 20, that says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Words can be filling. And we have read in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8, that the words of the talebearer are like wounds, are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Remember, words can also be like fillers. We can have to beware. And when it's a filler, we have to understand the truth that is said in verse 21, that death and life is in the power of the tongue. So here's a point of consideration tonight. What does my words bring forth? Does it speak death or does it speak life? Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 22. Whoso findeth a wife, Find it a good thing and obtain it favor of the Lord. A wife is a good favor from the Lord. So consider this. Have you thanked God for your spouse today? Well, do take time. Verse number 23, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 23. The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answer, answer roughly. Now, this rough answer of the rich lies in his security and his riches, which shows his arrogance, his conceit, and his pride, while the entreaty of the poor demonstrates his humility. Remember, the pride of the rich would lead to his downfall, while the humility, while humility leads to honor. Now, last verse, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. He that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And the truth is, a person that has friends is because he showed himself friendly. And a friend, a good friend, would stick closer than your very own brother. So consider this. What kind of friend am I? Now, wisdom causes us to pause and consider our ways. It is good to take a break amidst the busy moments of our lives and consider the wisdom of our ways. Most important of all is to consider the truth of the gospel in this dispensation of grace. That is the declaration how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We ought also to consider our way of life, whether we talk and walk in the ways of wisdom. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now we ought to consider our ways and amend it by the grace of God if it is needed. Now let me pray for you tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can pause to consider these things about wisdom. And we thank you, Father, that we can have this uh, pre-recorded broadcast and I pray, Father, for the truths that we have received from your word this evening to simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in a future broadcast. On Thursday, we'll resume our study of the Pauline pastorate as we look at the qualifications of the bishop of round two. And on Saturday, hope to catch you to in our Comfort Verses in Context series. We pray also to catch you again next Monday for another session of the precepts from the Proverbs. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.